Welcome, friends. I'm Pastor Jason Neely. I'm the pastor at Delta First Assembly of God. I want to say thank you for coming to this website and checking us out today. And, and I hope that this message that you're about to hear will powerfully impact you in a meaningful way. Today, I'd like to deal with the issue, and the topic is tongues for today. Is tongues for today. And with it, I'm obviously, I'm talking about your prayer language. Uh, when we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's your prayer language. I'm also talking about uh, the gift of tongues, which is separate. The gift of tongues is used in a corporate setting, the setting of a, a cell group, uh, a church service, uh, any kind of event that has God's people coming together. That is the gift of tongues. It's used in a corporate way to be spoken out loud for all to hear. And so the question I want to deal with today is tongues for today. And with that, I want to open up with the first part of the, the outline with asking a little bit broader question, are the gifts for today? Are the gifts for today? Did the gifts cease with the disciples? The first, le the first blank that you have there is cease. Did the, gifts, uh, did the gifts cease with the disciples? If you believe that the gifts have ceased with the disciples, this is called the doctrine of cessation. C-E-S-S-A-T-I-O-N, cessation. We are not cessationists. We believe the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today. We believe that indeed they are for today. The, the doctrine of cessation believes that at the dying off of the last of the disciples, the apostles, that once they died off and that first uh, century church died off, that the gifts no longer were uh, moving forward. They believed that they were finished. That once John died, John the, the apostle was the last disciple to pass away. They believe that at least shortly thereafter, if not directly with John's death, at least shortly with that, after that first generation of the Pentecostal church, that, um, that they ceased. And there's very little scriptural evidence for that. Very little. There's only one or two uh, verses that, that say, uh, there's one verse out there that says something to the fact that where, where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will cease. But the context of that one verse is talking about heaven. It's talking about eternity. It's talking about being in the presence of Jesus at the end of days in, in, in his presence. Uh, so the context of that one verse that says that is very weak. And it, the context is also there with heaven. We're talking about tongues and prophecy ceasing uh, because once we're in the presence of Jesus Christ, there will be no need for prophecy. There'll be no need for the tongues because we'll be speaking all together in, in a heavenly language, okay? Uh, so again, there's very little scriptural evidence that, to suggest that, uh, that, that the gifts of the Spirit will cease. There is an abundance of scriptural evidence that continues to state and say that the early church's intent was to, to work in and live in the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, there is so much more scriptural evidence that says that the intent of the Gospels, the intent of the epistles, was to continue to teach and preach about the gifts moving forward. If, if the gifts were to cease with the, the passing away of the Apostle John, then half of the New Testament is immaterial. Half of the New Testament is no longer necessary for us to read and to study. Uh, because a lot, of, if they believe the gifts have passed away, so much of what has been written uh, is about the gifts and about moving and working in the Holy Spirit. So there in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 38 through 39, it says this. Peter replied at the end of the, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the, the event of Pentecost has already taken place. And this is part of Peter's speech after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Verse 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise belongs to you and to your children and to all who are far off, to all whom the Lord our God will call to himself. And so we do not believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased. We don't believe that the gift of the Holy Spirit, singular, has ceased. We believe that what Peter is talking about here is the, is the power, the infilling, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that is designed and intended for all generations. Some might say, well, well Peter's talking about just salvation. No, I don't, believe, I don't believe that's what Peter is saying here. Well, what Peter is saying is repent and be baptized, and then it continues to go on, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When, we're, when we hear that word and that term, the gift of the Holy Spirit, that is continuing to be in line with, as we continue throughout the book of Acts, that is continuing to be in line with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so that promise belongs to you and to your children and all to who are far off. So the context there is generational. You, your children, and all who are far off. It's not talking about people that are miles and miles and miles away. It's not talking about people all the way in Italy. It's not talking about people all the way in Spain. When it's saying all who are far off, it's talking about generationally, generation after generation after generation. 
That was one of the first clues to continue to tell the church that, you know what, Jesus may be a while in returning. Jesus may be, uh, may be a while in coming back. But the promise is for each and every generation to all whom the Lord our God will call to himself. And so we believe that the Holy Spirit outpouring, baptism, whatever term you choose to use, is for all the church, for all generations. Some people have found it convenient um, to drop a few of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They like the miracles, they like the healings, they like the gift of faith. But when it comes to some of the verbal gifts, they say, no, those ceased. Those stopped. Those were only intended to build the early church. Those were only intended to build the first century church. It was such a dynamic, powerful set of gifts that it caused the early church to explode. I mean, it was, it was incredible growth. The Bible says that, the, that they added to the number of the church daily. The people were getting saved daily. Okay? Um, and so it was a powerful, powerful thing. But a lot of people today like to pick and choose the ones that they feel they understand. They like to pick and choose faith because they understand faith. They like to pick and choose healing because they understand healing. But when it comes to some of the verbal gifts like prophecy and tongues, they say, no, no, we're not comfortable with that one. So we will just say that those have ceased. Friends, you cannot cherry pick the gifts of the Spirit. You can't cherry pick the gifts of the Spirit. You can't pick and choose the ones you want and, and, and push away the ones you don't want. Now, on the flip side of that, on the other side of the coin, we have as Pentecostals, we would like to cherry pick the gift of tongues to the throwing away of the other gifts. Friends, I believe all the gifts are given to the body as the Holy Spirit hands them out. I believe that the Pentecostal church should operate in all the gifts. And so on the flip side of the coin, we as Pentecostals need to be careful that we don't just pursue the one gift of tongues. Okay? I believe we need to be in pursuit of all the gifts. All the gifts of the Spirit ought to be in operation in the modern day Pentecostal church. Amen? So some people believe that some of these gifts especially the gift of tongues, had ceased after the apostles. Why does it seem that, that tongues did that? Why does it seem to many people today that, that tongues have ceased or the gifts of the Spirit in general have ceased after the apostles? I've got five opinions. Five opinions. As I tried to ponder this and think through this this week, these are my five opinions. The collapse of Jerusalem in 70 AD was part of that. It's not a, a huge thing, but I believe it played a small role and why they believe that the tongues ceased after the apostles. Because by culture, as Christianity spread to the Gentile peoples, there were fewer and fewer documents and records. Records were being kept. The Jewish people were extremely meticulous people about keeping the records. In fact, the, the greatest record keeper that we have to tell us about the times of Christ in the first century is, is Josephus. How many of you guys have ever heard of Josephus? He was a, a great Jewish general. And he was captured by the Romans, and the Romans put him to work. They said, look, either you can write down all the history we want you to write down, or we're going to put you to death. They said, yeah, I'll write, I'll write some history books. And so Josephus put out tremendous volumes, awesome volumes of, of history about the Jewish people, because the Jewish people were known to be very meticulous. They wrote down everything because they believed that the words that they were writing down were God's words. I mean, when you believe that God is speaking to you or to your people, you will write those things down. The Jewish people were very meticulous. They were very uh, literate people. They wrote down uh, everything. The Jewish people highly regarded uh, literacy. They highly regarded education. They highly regarded all of those things because of God's Word, because of the Torah, because of the Law and the Prophets, the Pentateuch. And so these children, as they were raised up in any kind of a Jewish community, they would learn at the synagogue every day. They would learn to memorize God's Word. They would learn to study God's Word. And so with the collapse of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, with the destruction essentially of the Jewish people, some of that played a, a small role because the fire of Pentecost was going throughout all of the known world. But now there was a little bit, there was a community that had been destroyed. And so a lot of the Jewishness was beginning to be lost culturally. The Gentile peoples were not near as adept as writing things down that, re that uh, resorted to the Holy Spirit and uh, the things of God. The Jewish people were very adept culturally uh, to keep track of everything that was going on. So my second opinion is that not all centers of Christianity were taught about the Holy Spirit. I believe everywhere one of the apostles went 
an outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place. But remember, there's that one preacher that was, that was running around named Apollos. Remember, wherever he went, he was preaching, and people were getting saved, people were getting water baptized. But everywhere kind of Paul followed him around, they said, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Apollos was not one of the 12 disciples, and Apollos is never recorded as being uh, one of the 120 in the upper room. We don't know if Apollos was filled with the Holy Spirit or not. Maybe he had not even encountered that. So wherever Apollos went, we know that people were saved, we know they were baptized in water, but it seems like, according to the uh, <clears throat> book of Acts, wherever they followed him in preaching, they had not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. So I kind of put on there, there, there's no scriptural evidence at all, for my opinion. But I believe that Apollos went to some places, as well as other preachers, possibly the smaller rural communities that knew about Jesus and were bought or baptized, but had never experienced the, water, the, the, the spirit baptism. That's an opinion. But everything that we have in, the, in, the, in scripture, everything indicates that the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was normal. All of the churches that had an apostolic uh, leadership, speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Spirit was normal. It was normal operation. <clears throat> Let's see, went through that part. Number three, the opinion. A third opinion of why it seems that tongues ceased after the apostles because in A.D. 312, Constantine became a Christian and ended the persecution of Christianity. Constantine. He had seen a tremendous growth of Christianity. And some say that he could have seen the handwriting on the wall. He knew that Christianity was beginning to, to, to quickly come into being a majority religion in his day. Could you imagine after only two centuries, Christianity went from being just a handful of, a, of disciples to being hundreds of thousands of believers, if not millions. Within two centuries, the entire planet was changed. And that was because of the power of Pentecost, friends. That was the power of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that the entire known world at that time of the, we're not going to talk about China and Japan and all of that part of, of the region of the planet, but all of the known world that we have in the European environment was changed in two centuries. And so when Constantine became emperor, he's, he made an edict that said, no more, no more persecution of the Christians. Okay? Now, we don't know if he became a, a Christian or not. There's indication that he possibly did. We didn't know if it was for political reasons or if it was a spiritual reason. But when the persecution ended, I believe that the church began to set itself on a course that was not good or beneficial to the church. When the persecution ended, there became less and less of a reliance on the Holy Spirit. When the persecution ended, people no longer needed God as much as they used to when it was under persecution. And so that's an opinion that I have in regards to that. There was a lack of persecution. It began to slow the believer's pursuit of God. The fourth opinion that I have about why does it seem that the tongue ceased after the apostles was the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages and a high illiteracy rate. The Dark Ages. And a lot of reason for the Dark Ages is because of the church. A lot of reasons why the world history went in a demise was because of the church. The church split. There was a couple church splits, and all of a sudden you got factions, and you got different uh, belief systems, and they started attacking each other, and the, the, the literacy rate went way down, so people could no longer read God's Word for themselves. I mean, the Jewish people, they, they knew God's Word. They had it memorized. They could read it. They could read the Hebrew. They could read the Greek. But as we continue to march forward into the, the culture of the Greek starting to fade out and coming into a Latin language uh, culturally, uh, less and less people could read. Less and less people could read their, their own scriptures, and so they had to rely more and more upon whatever educated peoples were among them, the priests or the teachers, to be able to teach God's Word to them. They couldn't read it for themselves. And so as we kind of digressed into the Dark Ages, less and less people were reading God's Word because they couldn't read it. They didn't understand it. They were looking for those teachers and preachers that could give them God's Word. The fifth opinion that I have is a lack of teaching for one to two generations. Lack of teaching you know as well as I do, when you have one generation that is no longer taught the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is very difficult to get that teaching back on track again. You have, you have your youngest generations then being taught by your eldest generations because the generation in the middle missed it. 
And if we're not careful in America, we're in that position right now, okay? We're in that position right now of completely missing Pentecost because we like the good feelings of the charismatic movement. We like the good feelings about all that it has for us. But that, that speaking in tongues thing, we can put that aside because that's kind of weird. Let's go after the ones that are really going to be powerful and beneficial to the church, like, like healing and miracles, okay? Let's go after the ones like faith, the gift of faith. Let's build whole doctrines on that. But on these other things, let's sideline those verbal gifts a little bit. Let's just continue to remain as a charismatic church. And so when we have a lack of teaching for even one to two generations, that can cause the, the, the gifts of the Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit to start waning to start disappearing because people are no longer teaching about it. What do these, what are these, uh, these priests begin to teach about during those times of the Dark Ages? They started teaching and preaching about the Holy Wars, the Crusades, right? We started teaching about get-rich-quick schemes. Does that sound familiar? There's great blessing in it for you if you'll go to the Holy Land and slaughter the Muslims and take back Jerusalem. You can rape and you can pillage and you can murder without fear. The people cannot read God's word on their own. So they took the words of their priests and also of the Pope. And they had two or three or four different crusades that had nothing to do with God. It had nothing to do with God. And to this day, Christianity is still trying to live down the atrocities that were committed in the name of God. You know, even centuries later, we're still trying to live all of that mess down. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit was not a focal point for several centuries, was it? Because the focal point was get rich quick, you get down there, you can have, you know, if you get down there and you fight a holy war for the Pope and for the church, they will give you 100 acres for free. They'll give you all the gold and silver that you can, you can pillage. And so when we start getting distracted by prosperity, sometimes we'll forget about the gifts of the Spirit on the other side and the teaching of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've got to be careful. But the Pope promised everybody get to go to heaven for free. You join the holy war, you get to go straight to heaven for free. You know, a lot of where Islam is today is where the church was in the Dark Ages. There's a lot of parallels, a lot of similarities. Where Islam is today, you blow yourself up, you get to go straight to heaven, you get 40 virgins. The popes of the Dark Ages and the Crusades were preaching a lot of the same exact things. Rape, pillage, murder, get all of your assets, get land, free land, all in the name of God, and God will be happy and pleased with you. And so why did some of that, why does it seem like some of the gifts of the Spirit uh, waned in some of the, the centuries of our history? Those are my five opinions. But I do believe that the gifts of the Spirit even though they were not perhaps reported as often, we do have several, every century or two, we saw reports of an outpouring or a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in history. I'm going to give you some historical examples, uh, and this is going to show and to prove that the gifts of the Holy Spirit did not cease. They did not cease. But every generation, as they continue to have spiritual hunger, they would begin to pursue the Holy Spirit. Those that could read and became literate and could read the languages as they traveled on throughout the, the centuries, those that could read Greek, they began to understand the scriptures. Those that could read Latin could understand the scriptures. And they began to understand, hey, there's something here we're missing, and that's the Holy Spirit. So some historical references to Pentecost. I'm going to take this by, by every century or so. Justin Martyr, who died in about 165 A.D. This is a century after the apostles died. In his own writing, this writing called Dialogue with Trifo states, prophetical gifts remain with us even now to the present time. That was in Justin Martyr's writings, that prophetical gifts remain with us even now to that present time. Irenaeus, in 125 to 200 AD, in a work entitled Against Heresies, says this, For some do certainly and truly drive out devils, so that those who have been thus cleansed from evil spirits frequently believe in Jesus Christ for salvation and join themselves to the church. Others have foreknowledge of things to come. They see visions and utter prophetic expressions. Others still heal the sick by laying hands on them, and they are made well. Again, the gifts of the Spirit are an operation there are the times of Irenaeus. 
Tertullian, in 160 to 240, in a writing that he, he titled A Treatise on the Soul, said this, For seeing that we acknowledge the spiritual charismata or gifts, we too have merited the attainment of the prophetic gift. And so we again see the prophetic gifts, the, the gifts of the Spirit are working in the year 200 or so A.D. Origen, 185 to 284. Origen, in his writing against Celsus, Origen says, For by these means we too have seen many persons freed from grievous calamities and countless other ills which could not be cured neither by men nor devils. To these promises are added strange, fanatical, and quite unintelligible words of which no rational person can find the meaning. That's the words of Origen. And what he is describing there sounds very much like the gift of tongues or a, a prayer language of tongues. Pactomius in 292, 346 A.D. said this, an ancient writer described Pachomius with the ability to speak in a language that he had not learned. Ambrose, 397 A.D., in his theological writing entitled Of the Holy Spirit said this, the Father gives the gift of tongues, so too has the Son also granted it. In like manner we have heard also above concerning the Holy Spirit that he too grants the same kinds of graces. This is now almost 400 years after the apostles, and he is talking about the gift of tongues. Augustine. Augustine actually made derogatory remarks against miracles in his early ministry. But later in his life began to see the miracles taking place before his very eyes. And in one writing, he even describes what some charismatics might call singing in tongues. He says this, and for whom is such jubilation fitting if not for the ineffable God? For he is ineffable whom one cannot express in words. And if you cannot express him in words, and yet you cannot remain silent either, then what is left but to sing in jubilation so that your heart may rejoice without words and your unbounded joy may not be confined to the limits of syllables. Augustine. Are you guys starting to see a little bit of a pattern throughout the Dark Ages? With very, very, uh, there was not very much literacy. There was not very much writings. Very few people had the ability to read or write, but yet still there are evidences to the gifts of the Spirit being in operation even through the Dark Ages. Hildegard, in the year uh, 10, 1098. <clears throat> Hildegard was ridiculed for praying to the Lord for miracles and healings for individuals. Imagine that, she was ridiculed. According to referenced works, Hildegard also spoke and sang in tongues. Because of the great miracles that seemed to surround the life of Hildegard, and because many did not, did not understand them, some actually said that it was the work of demons. So we start seeing a little bit of the Inquisition as part of that. If they don't understand something, let's burn them at the stake. Hildegard was actually defended by Bernard of Clairvaux, who encouraged a visit to Pope Eugenius III. And in 1148, Pope Eugenius personally investigated the matter and said that all the miracles should continue through Hildegard. So again, according to the reference work, she sang and spoke in tongues. And the Pope even investigated her and investigated what was going on in her life, and he said, leave her alone, let the miracles continue. St. Stephen of 1396, he was on a mission to Georgia, not United States, Georgia. Okay, ocean sailed the blue in 1492. Okay, this is 1396, this is not Georgia. This is Georgia, like over in uh, Europe, Georgia, okay? St. Stephen on a mission to Georgia is reported to have spoken in the tongues of the natives, spoken in the tongues of the natives of the land in their own language, a language that he had never learned before. The Quakers, in 1650. Kind of an interesting thing here with the Quakers. Edward Burroughs, a personal friend to George Fox, an early Quaker, describes their charismatic experience. We receive the pouring down of the Holy Spirit upon us in the gift of God's holy, eternal Spirit, as in the days of old, and our hearts were made glad, and our tongues loosed, and our mouths opened, and we spoke with new tongues as the Lord gave us utterance. And as his spirit led us, which was poured down upon us on sons and daughters. I mean, it doesn't come, become any more clearer than that. Even the Quakers. So I remember when I, uh, growing up in the 80s, you know, and we'd go get some uh, Quaker 
roasted oats. You know, we get that big old cylinder. Remember those big old cylinders of, of oats, oatmeal? Yeah, got to get a big old guy's cheesy grin on the side of it with the hat. The Quakers. The Quakers said that in their times of, of revival that they would speak with new tongues. The Moravians, 1730. It's reported that the Moravians experienced a revival of speaking in tongues. John Roche describes this phenomenon as such, that the Moravians commonly broke into disconnected jargon, which they often passed on as the exuberant and resistless evacuations of the Holy Spirit. doesn't say tongues. But again, if they don't know and understand exactly what's taking on, it says that their tongues were loosed and they spoke with, with weird languages, disconnected jargon, he said. In 1751, we have the Methodists. Thomas Walsh, a personal friend of John Wesley, wrote this on his own journal. This morning the Lord gave me a new language I knew not of, raising my soul to him in a wonderful manner. Part of the Assemblies of God was born out of Methodist fire, the Methodist revival fires. We count a lot of our deep roots out of Methodism, okay? Part of that revival spirit that they had in the 17 and 1800s gave birth to the Pentecostal movement. Now today we don't have much in agreement with the Methodist Church because they've walked away from a lot of the revival fires and their belief in the, in the scriptures. But man, it was an awesome time. It was an awesome season there in the 1700s, 1800s. This morning the Lord gave me a language I knew not of. What does that sound like? Another one of the revivalists of 1750, Jonathan Edwards, Speaking in tongues was common during the Great Awakening Revival. In a book called Religious Enthusiasm and the Great Awakening, Mr. Lovejoy said this, These meetings would continue till 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, while others made uttering ecstatic expressions. Ecstatic expressions. Friends, that's just a, a snapshot. To some it gets a little laborious and cumbersome, but the point needs to be made that through many of the centuries that we don't know of, we say, well, the tongue ceased from the time of the John the Apostle dying away until 1900. We saw a huge revival, a huge resurgence of it in 1900. No, there are instances and markings of it throughout many of the church movements of the last 2,000 years. The gifts of the Spirit did not cease. You cannot cherry pick the gifts of the Spirit that you want to have in existence and deny the ones you don't. It's either all or none. There in Acts chapter 5, kind of brings it to a synopsis. Here in Acts chapter 5 and verse 33, there's a great one speaking here. This man is known as Gamaliel. As Peter and some of the disciples were hauled into the Sanhedrin and they were rebuked for what they were doing, for what they were saying. But Gamaliel stands up, the wise and teacher of the Jewish council. Gamaliel was Paul's teacher. Remember Saul got saved and God changed his name to Paul? This is the same Gamaliel. Same guy. Very wise. He says this in Acts chapter 5, verse 33 through 40. If it is of God, then there's nothing we can do to stop it. If it's not of God, then it will not last. Gamaliel's attitude was, step back, my brothers. Let's step back and see what happens. He gave, an ex he gave two examples of two different individuals who raised up in revolt, who raised up in rebellion against the Romans. And both of those individuals died and their, their work came to nothing. But Gamaliel says, look, if these guys, if their work is of the flesh, then it will still come to nothing. Let them be. They will kill themselves off. But if it is of God, there's nothing we can do to stop it. Don't get in the way of God. Friends, the Pentecostal movement today is the fastest growing faith movement in the world. It is projected by the year 2050, the Pentecostal movement will be the largest in the world. In many nations, the Pentecostal movement is the only faith movement that is growing. Here in America, the Assemblies of God is one of the growing denominations. We're one of the few growing denominations in America, but it's very slender growth. 
The church groups that are growing faster and ahead of us are sometimes we have traditionally called cults. Cults. Some of them are continuing to, to increase their numbers and continuing to go uh, forcefully advancing their cause. The Assemblies of God is there one of the few that are growing ahead. But our growth is more substantial throughout the rest of the world. I'll tell you what, the revivals that are occurring in Africa, that are occurring in Asia, that are occurring especially in South America, why do you think the Catholic Church voted in a pope from, from Latin America, the first one? Is because the Catholic Church has lost so much ground to the Pentecostal charismatic movement in South America, they're trying to stem the flow, stem the tide of the Pentecostal movement. The Catholic Church has suffered such great and tremendous loss because of the Pentecostal movement. So that's why they had the, the World Youth Day there in Brazil or wherever it was. Again, trying to, to fire up the base again, trying to get them excited. In fact, the Pope, two years ago, two or three years ago, had, had a meeting with one of the Pentecostal pastors there in Italy and uh, apologized to the Pentecostal leader. So we are sorry that you guys, we've put uh, so much persecution on you as Pentecostals in Latin America. We're so sorry what we've done in Latin America to the Pentecostal church. Uh, we need to understand that we are brothers in the faith, that we need to understand we need to come together. Uh, so there's, there's some glimmerings of that, you know. When we had the great awakening in the 70s, what we called the second wave, there was a char great charismatic movement, the second wave. Um, the only denomination that didn't rebuke the Pentecostals was the Catholic Church. Everybody was forced out of denomination. If they got filled with the Holy Spirit, they had to force them out of their denomination. Get, get out of here. Get rid of them. The Catholic Church was the only one that said, let's make room for the Pentecostals. And so a lot of times we like to stand back and throw rocks. Friends, we need to understand. We, in times like these, we've got to come together in our faith and find the common grounds, faith in Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and his ascension into heaven. We need to find some of the basic common grounds. Do we agree with all of their stuff? No, absolutely not. But in times like these, we need to quit throwing rocks at each other if we're going to survive here in America. <clears throat> Third and finally today, in the summary... A brief summary. Again, if you have any questions, get on your cell phone or get on your friends' cell phone. The first week, I had a lot of them on cell phone, and since then, nobody's asked, asked any questions. So um, if you have any questions, just give my phone a jingle. Summary. Speaking in tongues was a normal part of church life in the first century church. What we have in writings the Gospels and the Epistles, speaking in tongues and the gifts were a normal part of the church. Speaking in tongues was common in two different formats. First one is prayer language. Secondly, the gift of tongues, which is to be used for a corporate use. Next week, I think, maybe next week or the week after, we'll deal more with the, the, the gift of tongues being used in a corporate setting. Paul gave writings there, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that even the gift of tongues to only to be used two to three times in a church because it was so prevalent. It was so prevalent, Paul said, hey, let's shut it down to two or three times. You know, there were some people that stood up in that Corinthian church and said, you're trying to quench the Holy Spirit. Because <laughs> Paul said, we got we to get this cut down. Paul said two times, three at the most. Let's do it that way. Speaking in tongues was accompanied by all the other gifts. Speaking in tongues was not just the one gift that was used in the early church. Speaking in tongues was accompanied by all of the other gifts as well. And the final part, the final, final bullet of the summary is, is that tongues is not to be a standalone gift in the church. Standalone. It's not to be a standalone gift in the church today. The church that only operates in the verbal gifts is a broken church. The church that only operates in the verbal gifts is a broken church. Friends, we need to continue to understand that our pursuit as Pentecostals is not just after tongues. Our pursuit as Pentecostals is to reach out and try to understand all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Bible said that after the preaching of the Word, that the Holy Spirit confirmed the preaching of the Word with signs and wonders. Friends, I want the Word of God to be confirmed again with signs and wonders, but tongues is only one of those wonders. I want to see people healed. I want to see people, man, just blessed of God in powerful, mighty ways. I want to see miracles in the church. 
I believe it's the whole basket. God intends his church to operate in all of the gifts of the Thank spirit. you, friends, for watching today's message. I pray that it ministered to you in a powerful way. If you ever want to check us out for our contact information, just look again on the website, call the office, or check on Facebook at Delta First Assembly of God Church. Thanks again. God bless you.